This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Welcome back, everyone, to World to Win. My name is Toya, a member of the International Socialist Alternative in the United States. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and like this video. And if you are one of our regular viewers, welcome back. Our last episode, we talked about the explosive situations in Latin America. It was very exciting. So if you haven't checked out that episode, be sure to watch that after this one. But this week, we're going to go back to a little bit more of, you know, the theory side of things. We oftentimes flip flop back and forth. And I believe the last theoretical episode we did was on Leon Trotsky um, and his work called Permanent Revolution. But this week, we're going to go to someone who many people um, have heard of, and that's Lenin. He wrote a book called State and Revolution. It's one of the first books I read um, when I first got into, you know, socialist ideas. It's not that long. Totally check it out if you haven't. And if you just want the Cliff Note version, you're going to get that here today. It's an important book, even though it was written over 100 years ago, because it talks about um, what you know, the state is um, and why the state does what it does um, and how to fight for a better society. It's an, it answers a lot of important questions that we see even today in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement or even what's going on in Myanmar or Colombia, like we talked about last week. Um, so I'm very excited to kind of dive into this text um, with two returning guests. This week we have Paroka, um, who is a member of the International Socialist Alternative in Sweden. Um, and Laura, who's a member in Ireland. So before we get into the text, I want to hear um, what you two have been up to. I haven't seen you in a lot in a while. Laura, let's start with you. How's it How's it been going in Ireland? Oh, thanks, Katoya. Um, well, maybe I'll share with you um, just a recent scandal that's come out in Ireland, um, which is that even though we know that gender violence has been on the rise massively all around the world in the context of the pandemic. Um, it's just been revealed that the, the police in Ireland, the Gardaí, have been cancelling calls um, of uh, 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 women, children, men ringing up to uh, 999 emergency number because of um, uh, gender violence they're experiencing. And thousands upon thousands of calls were cancelled by the, by the police, by the Gardaí. And this scandal is only beginning to emerge. We haven't got the full story, but we can presume it was in the most deprived working class communities, maybe traveler backgrounds, those of migrant, the migrant population that were likely, most likely to be ignored and dismissed in such a brutal way. And just to kind of, because we're talking about the state today, Toya, and I finish now, uh, it's, it's in stark contrast to the fact that um, Rosa's socialist feminist movement um, that ISA supports, uh, some of our activists in Ireland have have just been fined, one of whom is facing um, criminal prosecution um, uh, for organising a symbolic uh, standout uh, calling for action on the shadow pandemic of gender violence during the lockdown. It was a, a socially distant protest with masks of less than 10 people and she's facing criminal prosecution in a state that it's just emerged. This is what the police were doing. So thought that might be an interesting little thing to share with Chitoya because of our topic today. Well, thanks for sharing and solidarity to her and um, good luck with that, you know, trying to defend her. And I, uh, I'll be looking out for, for what's going on. It sounds, it sounds terrible, um, Laura, but thank you for sharing. Um, Paroka, how about you? What's, what's Sweden been up to these days? Well, super calm Sweden, uh, things are happening. The, uh, the government was, uh, well, fell last week and the prime minister resigned yesterday. And the reason the government, uh, lost power was because of the issue of market rents. They wanted to introduce a neoliberal system that would increase rents with 30 to 60 percent for ordinary people. And there are about three million people in Sweden who rent their flats. And this is the main issue that our party has been involved in in the last two years and particularly this spring. So our comrades have been at the head of the rank and file grassroots campaign that uh, led to the government lost power. And uh, this issue from being totally unknown, they wanted to sneak it in and decided to become the main political issue and it's a class issue. So things are happening in Sweden. 
I won't even pretend to understand what it means when I hear the government fell. It's just something we don't have here in the US. Um, but it's exciting to see that our organization um, in Sweden is involved in something that is so crucial to people around the world. The question of rents is something that is really radicalizing a lot of people um, in many countries. So thanks for sharing, Paroka. Um, and I know there was an article recently written on the International Socialist Alternative website. So um, if you're interested more in what's going on there, you should totally check it out. Um, but let's get talking about Lenin. I'm going to start with Paroka. Can you just explain a little bit the context um, under which this, this book, State and Revolution by Lenin, was written? Well, Lenin uh, relied heavily on Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, on the original Marxists. And uh, in those days, as today, the capitalists said that, well, our system is the normal system. What exists now has always been existing. That goes for the private property has always existed, the family, the state. And Marx and Engels, they questioned all these eternal truths. They said, well, they found out it's not, not always been private property. There has not always been the type of family that is the so-called normal today. Not always been a state apparatus. And in fact, all those three had the common origin because when there was a surplus produced in society and a small group to control an ownership of that surplus, they needed, well, they invented them private property, obviously, but they also they needed a family to control it and they needed a state to control it. And the state, someone can think maybe the state is a country or the state is a nation or the state is a society, but the state is neither. The state is an organization to hold order, to give and keep the power with the ruling class. And that's needed when there, is, when there are shortages, when there is inequality, when you want to divide things more to some and less to others. And they also act in the common interest of the ruling class. Marx in Capital writes that uh, they had to stop child labor because the working class was about to die. The working class would not survive if every children, every child was working in the factories of textile industry and coal mining or so in England at that time. So the state also sometimes intervened against a wing of the bourgeois class. But the, the state is uh, preferably, they want it to be seen as impartial as something above, something intervening to sort out conflicts, to order the queues, to deal out rations. And uh, also when they need to punish someone, when they need, they need a force to, to put someone in prison or to uh, decide uh, that, well, you're breaking the law. And, and that's why the most important part of the state, Marx and Engels concluded, that's the police and the military. And Engels invented this uh, saying that the state is armed bodies of men. That's what the state is to its nucleus or the most important part. They also built, Marx and Engels also built on the experience of the Paris Commune. And, and that's uh, 1871 and, and it's 150 years ago and we've had episodes in World to Win about uh, the Paris Commune. The, the workers held power for two months. Karl Marx had criticism or advice to the workers who held that power. He said, well, you were isolated to Paris. It should have spread. You should have confiscated the central bank. But most important, you can't take the previous ruling apparatus into your own hands. You have to create your own new controlling apparatus. The working class needs its own state. It can't start from with no state because there will still be shortages. There will still be problems to deal with in society. So they need a, their own organ to organize the state. This was the basis from Marx and Engels on which Lenin built his conclusions and wrote State and Revolution. Thanks, Paroka. I remember when I was reading this book really, you know, having a completely different understanding 
um, of what the word state actually means and how Lenin um, and even Marx and Engels, as you mentioned, um, are using this word. And it really it really opens up your mind to you know understand how society works. So thank you for that. Um, Laura, can you talk a little bit more about what some of Lenin's main points were in this book? Yes, I can, Toy. Thank you. Um, uh, so Proko explained about um, the central premise of the, the class nature of the state. The state exists at the end of the day and at the root of it all to keep an elite class in power. Um, and with that, uh, one of the things um, that Lenin explained in State and Revolution was the very limited nature of even a parliamentary democracy under um, uh, the rule of capitalism, if you like. And that pertains and is still relevant today to all countries around the world, including those in which working class people have the important right to be able to vote. So a few choice quotes sum it up and then I can link it and explain it to, to what, what it is today. And um, he said to decide every few years which members of the ruling class is, is to repress and crush the people through parliament. This is a real essence of what he calls bourgeois parliamentarianism, the, um, including in democratic republics. And he goes on to say that it's a democracy hemmed in by the narrow limits set by capitalist exploitation and consequently always remains in effect a democracy for the minority, for the rich. Um, and just how prescient was that written 100 years ago, how it actually sums up and explains uh, the reality of, of capitalism all around the world today. Um, and that's the case in so many ways. So, for example, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the, the likelihood even that in um, uh, bourgeois democracy, what I mean is like capitalism, but you have the right to democratically vote, the fact that the people from the in the positions of power politically, in the media establishment, so on, they generally come from the Bourgie background. And, um, uh, you know, in Ireland, one of the big things at this point in time is the fact that a huge amount of, of the members of parliament are landlords. And one of the biggest issues facing, if not the biggest issue facing working class people in Ireland is uh, the housing crisis. Um, uh, it means that, you know, wh where is the real source of power in capitalist society? It's the people that we don't even vote for. It's the, the CEOs, the head of the, you know, major, major corporations. Um, look at workers today in the airline industry, in the retail industry. Look at healthcare workers. Um, you know, when did they have the right to vote on things that affect really their lives? Um, uh, actually, the, the powerful, the, the, the capitalist economic interests and so on, um, and the tiny elite in reality that profit enormously from that are the ones that make the decisions and are leaving workers in horrendous situations. Look at healthcare workers who are going to emerge en masse all around the world with, you know, collective trauma, mental health crises, burnout from the what they've been forced to, to, to deal with in the pandemic. They never decided or had a real vote on whether, why, you know, despite um, all the wealth that exists in the world, public health care has never been properly funded, you know. Um, these are, uh, you know, the, 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 he, he, he refers to the, the, the deep limits of uh, democracy, even in countries where you have the right to vote. We know all around the world, there's so, so many countries in which people don't have uh, even that right. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the big, one of the biggest superpowers in the world, China, where, you know, extreme repression and a dictatorship um, uh, is the reality that working class people face, banning of trade unions, all of these questions. Um, and then he goes on to make the point, he, 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 he explains, and at the heart of, of state and revolution is an incredibly emancipatory vision of socialist change. Um, uh, he, he counterposes this lack of democracy to uh, that which is ultimately democratic, which is um, the, the working class, the poor and oppressed and exploited all of the world coming together, fighting, getting active, the mass participation 
participation of the masses in politics in a way the capitalist ordinary uh, everyday capitalist misery and inequality completely goes against um, and uh, that sort of that if you like revolutionary struggle because that's what a revolution is it's the mass participation of the working class and oppressed in in politics in society on a day-to-day -day basis that is the opposite of what we know every single day um, and he counterposes that that revolutionary movement and struggle and um, uh, to the repression of the state and he explains very clearly that the working class movement needs a very clear analysis of the state so that it can actually challenge it fight it and defeat it and build its own um, uh, uh, working class democracy and alternative state that if you like is repressive for a period but it's you know a working class movement has to disempower the 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 the, the super rich elite and then it needs to ensure that that it, it keeps itself in power for the for the future of the people and environment and 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 all that we need is necessary um uh uh you know for the sake of of uh the vast, vast majority of human beings on the planet. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Laura. You know, when you're talking about uh, democracy in our world today, um, you know, who and who has the real power in society. It's the CEOs, it's the, the people who control commerce, it's, and, and even, you know, the people who work under them have no control um, over, you know, what actually happens in society. We go every, you know, year or every couple of months to vote for a couple of uh, people that are going to be in the legislature, um, but the actual decisions that are being made, you know, we as workers have no control over that. Um, but Paroka, I want to, you know, we talked a little bit about what the state is, um, but Laura was starting get it, getting into the second half of the book, which is revolution. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what that looks like and what happens after. Lenin uses this term a lot called dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, and it sounds a little outdated. Um, so maybe we can talk about what that actually means and what uh, is needed for a successful revolution. Okay, I mean, State and Revolution, the book, was written in, in August and September 1917, so it was written during the revolution. Lenin had a bundle of notes which he took with him to Finland and uh, worked on this book to develop a program for the revolution. And he based himself on the Paris Commune. He said that, for example, there should be no privileges. There should be everyone who is responsible for anything should be elected and there should be a possibility to reselect or, or take out that person from their positions. There should be a rotation of posts and there should also be democratic control of arms. And the, the state forces, Lenin concluded, they are the main organs of counter-revolution. If you look at Myanmar now or, or Colombia, it's the army that is used against those who are protesting. They are shooting people. They are uh, uh, violently attacking and they are arresting masses under protests. And that was also, of course, the, the case in, in Egypt previously and in Sudan a couple, two years ago during the revolutionary events in Sudan. The old state has to be purged. And that goes to begin with, with the generals, with the officers, with the police commissioners, the bosses of all repressive forces. And the soldiers or, or the rank and file in the repressive apparatus can maybe be won over or they can be neutralized by masses who have control of their own arms or democratic control of that. Social democracy or social democrats, and, and I understand in the US now there is a bit trendy to be a supporter of Karl Kautsky, Kautskyists as well. They never understood the Marxist theory of the state. If you look at, at Sweden, it was an example of reforms. Social democracy, of course, never attacked the capitalist, but it also never changed the state. They left the generals, the managers of state uh, authorities, agencies, institutions, departments, untouched. They were kept and they could then hit back against the welfare reforms when the kind of social counter-revolution started. Or of course, they, they didn't touch the monarchy either, who is also part of the state. And the dictatorship of, of capitalists, 
or as we say now, or we've said for a while, the dictatorship of, of the market has to be replaced by democratic workers' rule. And that's what Lenin meant with the dictatorship of the proletariat. The proletariat in Russia, of course, was a minority of the population. In most countries, the working class, the proletariat is another word for the working class. They are the majority of the population, or when they are in a minority, they are supported by the poor masses or, uh, and, uh, and the oppressed. Uh, and this is a transitional regime. When the working class put up their own state, that is not a state to develop to a new oppressive apparatus. It's a state that is, that is supposed to uh, be uh, less and less important, have a less and less weight within society, with more and more people involved and, and getting the fruits of what is produced in society. It will gradually disappear. Today, the state can include some public sector welfare and people will say, well, well, we're against privatization. Doesn't that mean that we're in favor of the state? And, and of course, some parts of public sector welfare are concessions to the working class. They're not needed for production. The capitalist can produce without having a system of pensions, which they of course have in countries where they have been able to do that. They can, they can be without elderly care. They, they can also be without unemployment benefits. They don't need that. But this, this now, of course, also is paid by the taxes, uh, this working class paying taxes and then pay for that. But still, there are other parts of the public sector welfare today. For example, uh, so some social security, uh, childcare that is needed for production. They need uh, the whole working class. And for that, they have to, in some countries, to uh, uh, organize childcare. The, uh, those organs also have some repressive uh, part. The miners in the miners' strike in Britain in 1984-85 said they were as afraid of social authorities as of the police because that could uh, the social authorities could, could take decisions about their children, about where, about their housing benefits, and such things. So, and some. In any capitalist state, they want those people to have some privileges. If you're, a, if you're a boss in the state, you should behave and you should be paid almost as if you're a boss in a company. And, and minor bosses as well should have, should have a little bit privileges. So us defending against privatization doesn't mean that we, we defend parts of the state that will uh, continue to exist after the working class has taken power. It means that they will be democratized. They will be controlled and ruled by the people working there and the people using those uh, utilities. And they will be run democratically. More important is, of course, the police, the military, the courts, the, the prisons and everything like that, which has to be uh, well uh, completely purged. And then, uh, well, under socialists, there will be some criminals. But, uh, but, and, uh, but there will be a democratic control and a, a completely different system of uh, organizing that. The, the capitalists and the bourgeoisie today prepare for battles. That's why they give more resources to the military, the police, and, and uh, they expand those sectors of the state. And so that's again proving what uh, Lenin said about the state. Those are the kind of issues confronting us when we want to prepare for working class taking power and dealing with the state. Thanks so much, Paroka. You know, you talked a lot about what the state, you know, can provide, needs to provide, doesn't need to provide. I know uh, when you mentioned childcare, I know that's something that resonated with with Laura as a as a working mother. Um, it, it's so hard to be able to provide those types of things, um, you know, to work and care for your children at the same time. It's something that Laura actually has come on our show to talk about before the you know situation with um, uh, working class women around the world. Um, but Laura, I was wondering if we could take another phrase that Lenin uses in this book and kind of dissect it a little bit. He says the withering away of the state. What does that mean? Good question. Um, so as Paroka has explained really well, um, the state is about, fundamentally, it's about um, repression and about uh, uh, keeping the class in power in power. It's about backing them up, you know. 
and it has all sorts of elements to it, as Baroque explained there. But, you know, there is the very clear uh, repressive element and times of class struggle. That's when it's mo most obvious why, you know, in Ireland during the COVID crisis, the Debenhams workers, retail workers who launched a, a huge battle against corporate greed were um, arrested and physically dragged from the picket lines, including a pregnant woman worker. Um, uh, you know, while uh, the COVID crisis was raging. So so the, if, if the state's about repression, then, you know, our socialist vision and our viewpoint and our perspective for what kind of society we want, and Lenin's summed it up by actually saying it will be a society without co coercion, without subordination, without the special apparatus for coercion called the state. So an incredibly democratic vision of what sort of society we want and we're fighting for, and we believe is possible, right? So when there, if there's no class division, if there's no different classes, <laughs> a, a classless society would not need a state because it wouldn't need uh, repression. Um, but Laura, if there's no state, isn't that what anarchism is? Isn't, you know, the idea that there's just no state at all? Yeah, well, it's a good question. Like, the thing is, we, you know, um, Marxists have something in common with, with like, left-wing socialist anarchists in that, like, our vision for what sort of society we want to achieve is the same. Um, but I think that the difference is uh, around... Um, uh, how, Len how Lenin explained how the withering away of the state would be achieved after a, quite a significant working class battle has been waged. That would include if you have to if you have to um, build a, a working class movement, a revolt, and revolutionary struggle from below that goes head to head with the capitalist state that wants to to smash all its 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 repressive and coercive apparatus and take power into the hands of the working class and um, including by uh, taking the key sources of uh, uh, wealth the, the the key levers of the capitalist economy taking that into public hands taking that into the hands of the working class movement that is going to you're going you're going to need to have a, a state to to defend that gain, um, but the question is that it's it, you know as as Paroka explained your your state is going to be built on the basis of that movement on the basis of that struggle and um, a, a, an alternative democratic source of power um, uh, including uh, you know democratically. Uh, arming the, the working class engaged in revolution. We can see in Myanmar how necessary that is. It's not some abstract thing when you can see the real reality of the working class struggle against this brutal, brutal system at play. Um, and uh, the, 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 the repression that's necessary would be a repression to prevent the ruling class from taking back power from the capitalists who are not just going to give up without a fight. So actually, that's the sort of state that's necessary. But if you, you know, this is a fundamental international battle for 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 um, the rights and um, ascendancy of the working class, poor and oppressed all around the world. And, you know, the, 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 the revolutions in one country will, will um, as it did 100 years ago, even in Lenin's time, will, will uh, be give huge impetus to the revolutionary struggles in, in other countries and so on. And you in that context, you will have the movement fundamentally for socialist change and fundamentally to disempower the, the ruling class in capitalism and to begin to build a socialist alternative. And the withering away of the state is you're talking about a time where the, the you know, there's no want, there's no poverty, there's no need for it. We know the wealth's there. We know that working class people are capable and ordinary people, the masses are capable of having a society that's that's democratic, that the needs of people are catered for and so on. Um, uh, that's the context in which over a long period of time um, you, you'd, you'd actually have a classless society without the need for any repression. So the no need for a state. So this is something that, that you know, Marx and, and Lenin and so on it, it's it, that their idea was always that for something that would develop over time and if you like it's for future generations our, our role now is to ensure that we have the right program um, and anarchists don't because they um 
they see correctly that the state is repressive, but they don't have a clear view of why it's repressive. It's it's not the the the, the, the state flows from the concrete need of the ruling class to keep power, and that's where where it's you know it's it, it, the battle against the state is inevitably a battle against the capitalist class in all of its, including the political establishment. The include you know um, uh, we will use by the way every single um, uh, every single opportunity opportunity available to us within the, the the current system and state to raise our program and you know if we it can get um uh, in Ireland we have a member of parliament if we put forward a you know a socialist working class program and fight in that uh, without any illusions of the program and so on but but always with a clear-sighted vision of what the state is that the working class movement and the need to fight it and also that 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 revolutionary change is going to require the working class to form its own democratic um, uh, uh, structures and organisation, and um, in order to 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 forward the interests of of socialist change all around the world. So it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, the fight for socialism uh, has a plan. Basically, there's a there's a there's a path that we can take. Whereas when we're talking about anarchism, you know, the idea, uh, you know, the conceptualization, if that's a word, of the state is the same. Um, but under anarchism, there isn't really a plan uh, to move us forward to a better society. No, I mean, even in, I mean, like, if you take examples like in Rehova, uh, you know, Kurdish activists um, who, uh, so, you know, signed up, they were in a very specific situation there in Rehova, and the, the, you know, Syrian forces had vacated it for various reasons, and they were purporting to, to be anarchists, but they actually built a state like they had a state so even those that um have this theory that you don't need a state and so on it's it just goes against the practical reality we want to live in the practical reality <laughs> practical real world about how we best uh uh you know fight this brutal system and by the way recognize how 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 powerful capitalism is how powerful its state is and and, and be no way naive about what kind of struggle we need to wage to defeat it you know and um, so before we go too far off i love this we're gonna have to have you back on to talk about the difference you know going into depth of anarchism and socialism so make sure you're keep your schedule open because we're gonna have to have you on for another episode i want to go back to paroka so we talked you know about the theories that lenin was writing about um you know and how to get from where we are today to where we want to go but lenin wasn't just writing this out of nowhere because these were, these were just ideas that he had right his uh situation was dictating uh that he needed to fight for a better world so paroka can you explain how that played out during lenin's time well i, I make an attempt the 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 fact was during 1917 the other socialist parties, they either had not understood the Marxist theory of the state or they, they dropped it. And they supported the provisional government that uh, came after the Tsar had been overthrown. And that meant even going into supporting the army. It was during the First World War. Two or three million Russian, had, Russian soldiers had died or Russians had died in that war. But the Parties who didn't understand the state, they still supported the Russian army in the war. Then, uh, I mean, they thought that the political revolution was enough. It was enough to overthrow a regime. And this is the lesson that also has to be drawn from the revolution in, in Egypt 2020-2011, when Mubarak was overthrown and people thought now we've secured the revolution, but the military was still there and could organize the counter-revolution. Lenin said, well, we have to win the majority. We have to disarm the standing army. We have to arm the working class. We have to abolish all, all, all old power structures. And, and how to organize this? And by the way, this, this is linked to what Laura said, which was really good on anarchism and so on. The anarchists supported the Bolsheviks on this. Most good anarchists understood that we have to take power. The, the slogan, don't take power, smash it, as anarchists said, didn't work. Because if you do not take power, the old power will still be there. So they, they organized so that when there was the second Congress of the Workers' Councils, 
the, the Second Congress of the Soviets, which was the name of the Workers' Council. That Congress confirmed that it was correct to organize the insurrection to take power, to purge the old state apparatus and organize a new working class state apparatus. And then they used the Paris Commune lessons. They introduced a system of how the officials in the new state apparatus should have no privileges, should have uh, regular wages, should be elected, should be under control of working class. And then this state immediately took incredibly radical decisions. They decided there should be peace, there should be no First World War. They decided to give freedom to oppressed uh, nations like Finland, Ukraine and others. They also decided a lot of liberties for, uh, for example, they said there, there is the right to divorce. There is the uh, other really important first decisions of any democratic kind uh, compared to all other states. And, and that's uh, so. I mean, they also they, they implemented a new system, but they also took very, very radical decisions. Then, uh, and of course, the, the, the slogan for peace made them uh, having a big support among soldiers, a big support among regular soldiers who didn't want to continue that hopeless First World War. But then they didn't organize their own army until counter-revolution started to use individual terror against uh, Bolshevik leaders. The, the foreign armies invaded Russia uh, from, from, the, from 11 different countries, 21 armies. And then they organized the Red Army, which was almost, uh, well, 10 months after they've taken power. And, and that Red Army was completely different from the army that had existed during the Tsar. It was democratically organized. It had a different structure. And of course, they also, uh, they were fighting for something else. They were fighting for a different society, for uh, control over the land. That's what I, I forgot to mention before. The most important, one of the most important decisions was this incredible land reform involving tens of millions of people on the countryside. So this state, changed and rocked the world as much as the revolution itself. And it organized a completely different system of defense and order in society. So the thing is, Lenin did not live to be an old man. And whether this did or did not have an effect on the outcome um, of, you know, what happened after the time period that, uh, you know, Paroko was talking about, um, you know, it's important for us to acknowledge uh, the processes that played out. So, Laura, what happened next? This is a crucial question, Toya, um, because it links back to the points earlier about withering away of the state and so on. Um, we know that Stalin declared um, later on after he came to power, etc., declared that so they'd achieved socialism, right? So, now, this goes completely against the, the, um, the whole vision of, uh, of, of Lenin and state and revolution. It goes against the whole idea of the, the withering way of the state, was actually, which was actually the idea that, you know, uh, even after the workers take power, you'd have a worker state for a whole period and you'd be fighting, uh, continuing the international struggle against the capitalist uh, class and, and that, you know, socialism could not be achieved in that context because you'd still have um, many, many of the problems that existed previously could not just be eliminated, eliminated overnight. So concretely, um, uh, after the October Revolution, the, the revolution was isolated. The, the um, you know, uh, working class and the likes of Germany that was incredibly huge, strong, extremely organized, extremely powerful, um, uh, uh, very socialist and organized in a mass way uh, as, as a so in socialist, a socialist organization. 
the leadership that had accommodated itself in reality to capitalism um, and participated in the ultimate betrayal of the working class of supporting imperialism and the First World War, um, uh, you know, basically ensured that the working class did not achieve uh, a taking power in the way that it could have in Germany in the years after the Russian Revolution. Therefore, the isolation of the Rus Russian Revolution was compounded the, you know, t uh, many cap imperialist powers invaded, the, the, the state had to wage a fight and the working class state had to wage a fight against those imperialist powers. There was generalized poverty and want because, um, as Paroka indicated earlier, it was not a developed capitalist country in which the working class took power. The working class was a, even a minority in, in Russia at the time and so on. And there wasn't just the sort of um, ability for the... Uh, a worker state to just seize what had already been developed by capitalism and taken into public hands and didn't exist. So um, Trotsky made a very important analysis because a, a contribution in terms of his analysis, he obviously alongside Lenin, a key leader in the, the October revolution, but also he um, explained what happened under Stalinism. And he, he summed it up in a very um, clear way by saying, if you have a queue, and somebody has to police the queue. So in the context of the poverty, the want, the inequality that was still there in the isolated revolution, despite all that they'd achieved and done, there was a basis for actually the state to get stronger, even with the you know, best will in the world. Um, concretely, the only check on working class democracy was the, 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 the working class fighters that participated in the, the revolutionary struggle, being part and parcel of decision making every single day, etc. But that became difficult over time in the context of the isolation of the revolution. And um, uh, that, you know, very, very difficult. And in that context, then a bureaucracy began to um, form at the top. Um, uh, having the ability to, to form at the top. And Stalin obviously personified that and uh, strengthened it, consciously strengthened it. And in that context, yes, the state got stronger because you needed repression. Um, uh, so, you know, apparently it was socialism, but obviously it was not um, uh, for all the reasons uh, we explain uh, or uh, I, I alluded to there. Um, and, you know, he he began to go against concretely all of the, the emancipatory vision of socialism that's at the heart of state, state and revolution. Um, that's the, the reality. And there's very, very important lessons for today. Obviously, socialists later on would have advocated Trotsky that there needed to be a political revolution. You needed to, 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 to the working class to rise up and get rid of this caste, this bureaucratic caste at the top. And... Um, uh, 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 all of the policies of Stalin and the state that he presided over was to quell working class activism and agency um, precisely so that the bureaucracy could continue their privileged position and so on and their foreign policy, their policies in terms of, you know, taking away the gains that the revolution had made in terms of uh, women's rights and democratic rights and so on were all linked to this um, reality. So um, that's just, sorry, not, not possible to explain it in a more developed way, but I'm sure there'll be many more uh, World to Wins and we'll go into it in more detail, Toya. So as we've mentioned a few times here throughout the show, um, you know, the, the capitalist state is huge and powerful um, and has become ever more repressive um, against working people um, due to the COVID pandemic. Um, and so, Laura, can you talk a little bit about how um, the lessons that uh, Lenin is trying to draw out here for us in this book, State and Revolution, can apply to the fight today? Yeah. Um, I think one, one point that I'd um, highlight, Toya, is when the COVID crisis hit, obviously, um, the interest of, of the working class movement um, the intervention of socialists in whatever way we could was we need to fight this virus and put public health first, fight it in every way we possibly can. Um, uh, one of the things, though, in this context was, um, yes, capitalist states did use this opportunity to uh, bring in repressive legislation 
um, that, uh, you know, they couldn't get passed at any other time or raised in any other time and uh, have that there as something that then could be used in future against the working class movement. And, uh, you know, even in my own country, unfortunately, um, many of our colleagues in the broader left and our friends in the broader left would have been um, not so clear on, on these questions when they came up because they felt a pressure for... Um, uh, to go along with things in the context of a sort of we're all in this together mood at the very start of the COVID crisis and shirking a class analysis. And, and what this book says is we cannot do that. You will um, rue the day you do that uh, because we have to at the, understand and not forget our, our class analysis of, uh, you know, whose interest this state protects. And it's very, very important to, to always put the, you know, in everything that you do, every issue that comes up, you have to look at it from the point of view of uh, uh, the working class movement, the interests of the working class struggle, because that's actually the only way we're ever going to end oppression and inequality. So that is, um, to me, that's the sort of one of the key things that we have to think of and um, bring as very, very relevant to today, Toya. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I want to go to Paroka. I was wondering if you could give us an example, um, you know, in today's context where you see the, the relevance of state and revolution. Well, if you look at Sweden today, there is a discussion, uh, what is best for Sweden? We, have, we, we don't have a government. What's going to happen? And they pretend that we are all in the same boat and we are not. We don't have the same interest. And uh, some people, and this is not semantic, some people say, well, we deport refugees. We give permits to mining companies destroying the environment. They say that uh, we, we have a catastrophic record on uh, dealing with men's violence against women. And we explain, well, this is the state. This is a capitalist state. It's a capitalist state deporting refugees, young refugees to Afghanistan. It's a capitalist state helping mining companies to destroy the environment. It's the capitalist state upholding the capitalist values or bourgeois values on uh, men's oppression of women. So that's, uh, or the state suppression of women that, that is added to that. So, I mean, the state is not our organ. The state is something that uh, we have to struggle against in most occasions like that. And we have to show that it has a class character. So that's part of what we're dealing with today in Sweden and elsewhere, I guess. Laura, what about you? Do you have any examples where this book is super relevant today? Yes, Toya. I, there are so many, but one that I wanted to just hone in on is um, how amazingly and in many ways inspiringly um, slogans such as uh, abolish the police, abolish prisons have actually been popularized amongst, um, you know, a, a certain part of the population in the US and especially, but then in some countries also around the world in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this is, you know, in many ways, uh, brilliant to see because it's, um, uh, you know, young people uh, uh, fighting back against oppression and seeing how oppressive the state is and their right to call out how oppressive the police are, how oppressive the, the prisons are um, under capitalism. That is correct. But it's interesting to me because it's about like those slogans, those slogans and those ideas. Are they are they useful slogans for a movement and for building struggle? Or put it this way, how do we actually achieve abolishing the capitalist police? How do we actually achieve abolishing capitalist prisons? And um, the you know, it, it has to be completely connected to a wholesale view and vision of the class struggle and class movement. We have to build working class and oppressed people power against the capitalist state and um, we you know we need a, a, a wholesale program that takes in all the day-to-day -day issues that working class people are faced with be it the housing crisis be it um, uh, you know uh, oppressive police and, and racial violence from the state and, and bring them together in a movement that can actually uh, uh, radicalize and uh, bring on board the biggest number of the working class 
the working class and oppress people. And those slogans, it's like the conclusion. You've drawn the conclusion, but you, you don't have any perspective or program about how to how to build a real struggle that's going to achieve it. So that's it. To me, that's um, very, very relevant from, from Lenin and State and Revolution and looking concretely about what he really did and really led uh, uh, alongside the, you know, the cream of, of the working class and, uh, movement in Russia at the time of actually achieving, uh, 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 defeating the, the oppressive state and bringing in a, 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 st a st revolutionary working class state from below. Thank you so much, Laura. It's so true. We have these slogans, we fight for these slogans, but how are we going to get um, to those things that we're calling for? And this book, State and Revolution, um, is a great, uh, you know, first step guide in how to get there. Of course, being organized in an organization um, is another great way to be able to fight for a better world. I want to thank you both for filming with us today. I know Paroka has been checking the television because Sweden right now is tied up in a soccer game. So good luck to you, Paroka. I hope it turns out um, in the way that you're wishing. Um, and thanks so much for coming with us today. And now for the shout out of the week. This week, we're talking about a big virtual rally that the International Socialist Alternative is having. This won't be the last time you hear about it, but it is a rally for a socialist world that's hap happening Excuse me, on July 24th. You can find all the details down below um, in the description. Um, it's going to be an exciting event with speakers from all continents. Um, we're going to have English, Spanish. We're going to have... Um, probably eight more languages. Um, so let us know if there's any languages that you want to hear it in. Um, let us know in the comments. But yeah, no matter where you are in the world, you should totally tune into this rally. It's going to be a great time. Um, so I want to thank you for tuning in today. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and share this video. Um, and we'll see you all next week. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast-moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!